right? All of these expensive big ticket items that don't always translate into increasing rental income, but are really important to us as the owners can be caught or bought as a result of getting a, a successful insurance claim. Um, on the uh, Lincoln portfolio that we bought this summer, we're looking at, and we've essentially got approved, a seven-figure insurance claim that's coming to us. It's the biggest I've ever been exposed to or benefited from. And it's fantastic, because it's it didn't come out of the seller's pocket. Um, it only bolsters our uh, renovation budget and our ability to stabilize and really um, fix the properties up. Um, a lease audit uh, and a rent roll audit. So when you're, when you're working on a larger project, um, I mean, anything we buy, right, we want to see the leases. When we're buying a 200, 300 unit uh, project, it's just that much more labor intensive and that much more time intensive. Excuse me, we want to make sure that the listing broker was being forthright with us. We want to make sure that the seller was telling us everything that's happening. We don't want phantom income. We don't want uh, you know $1,000 in pet fee every month that doesn't really exist in the lease. So we've got to verify everything down to the cent. Um, full mechanical and structural inspections. Um, I know you guys are all familiar with those. Okay, so kind of getting down to you know one of the last of the higher level topics, asset management. I want to contrast the difference between property management and asset management. Um, when we operate a, a syndication, uh, the operators in, in the project are oftentimes the asset managers as well. You can hire that out as well. Um, I prefer to maintain that, uh, that exposure and that role. The asset manager is managing the manager and the responsibility that the asset manager has is to ensure the fulfillment of the business plan. So when we've gone out and, <coughs> excuse me, and I, I sell a project to an investor that says, this is how the project is gonna perform. That's my responsibility to ensure that it performs that way. A lot of that has to do with helping the property management company understand the vision of the plan, understand where we want the income to, to, to go at what intervals. So um, if, we bought a, if we buy properties at $60,000 a door for each apartment um, and they're you know, making 600, 700 bucks a month in rent, but we know that when they're fixed up, we can charge 900, 950, $1,000 for rent. It's our responsibility as asset managers to make sure that the property management company is taking the steps and that we're providing the resources, the communication to see that that happens. Because ultimately, that's where the benefit from this work comes from. Um, I think I covered a lot of that. Construction management, um, achieving stabilization, so stabilization in the syndication world is a reference to a property that has gone through the capital improvements, the apartments have been renovated, uh, the rent is, the gross income is now at the level that we projected it to be, and then we'll call the project stabilized. Oftentimes that's a point in the project's lifespan where it's either disposed of or it's refinanced. So uh, cash out refinances, um, who's done one? Right, those are, those are some of the, those are the, that's one of the, the beauties of our, um, of our field, is the ability to go in, raise value, go to a lender and say, I bought it at this, now it's worth this, we wanna re-leverage the debt, put new debt on it, and we wanna take that, that delta in value out as cash. That gets distributed to the owners, to the partners and the owners. Um, I threw up just uh, a couple of items on the Lincoln, we call it Lincoln Logs One, it's the 171 unit portfolio. I wanted to give some metrics for um, kind of how that's structured. There's about 35 investors in that project. Um, Four million was approximately the raise or the down payment that we needed to provide. Um, we, had, uh, we had about four million, just shy of that committed in about uh, 72 hours, about three days. And then it was sourced over a longer period of time. Um, the committed part, it doesn't mean everybody had their checkbook out but us as uh, sponsors, as operators, have, we can see the path. It's important to know early on, okay, what's the path I'm gonna pursue to get the investment? So important to have that early on, and we had confidence really early on that we could achieve that. Um, the next part of this kind of discussion gets into that next to last bullet, 
Uh, we're going to talk about kind of the changing market here in just a moment. We, we, again, we closed in July, so rising interest rates, you know, we've been hearing about those for nine, ten months, even longer. As we were putting the debt together, we had a number of banks say, yeah, we agree. This looks like a great project. We'd like to be involved. As we went through the conversations with them, and as interest rates start going up, and as banks were getting more conservative about their lending, they started to, to peel back. And that happened with about five banks before we ultimately got the deal closed in the middle of July. Um, it's difficult to raise money and to go out to investors and say, here's the structure, here's the debt terms that we've got, and then turn around and go, whoops, those debt terms are gone. Now we have new debt terms. Um, doesn't look very sophisticated, doesn't look like an operator knows what they're doing if they're going back to their investors and saying, hey, you know that great debt that I just told you about? Well, it doesn't exist anymore. So we really had to kind of uh, start, stop our, invest our uh, capital raising. Um, but I'm really proud of the fact that we were able to get it done in that environment. Um, I mentioned the five banks to get across the finish line. So, Hey, well, Stephen. Uh, yeah. Question for you. So 35 investors, um, I, like, is that a lot of work, just dealing with 35 people that have constant questions? Or, or like maybe could you describe what the dynamic is like between people that have money and they're like, I don't have any time to do this. It sounds like a good deal. Take my money. Yes. And what happens after the point of you sitting down with them and then, you know, the project goes forward? Is it a, is it a total pain? Is it not bad? Is it like, are yeah. most people pretty cool? Or is it just like a whole bag of cats that you should uh, take it down yourself if, you, uh, if at all possible? Y you know, I think it's, uh, speaking from my own experience, yes, it's important. It's a lot of work. Um, very few times would I say it's incredibly difficult because again, to, to, to work with investors after the fact, because again, it's, it's really important that we match the right investor with the right project. And so part of that is, is, is accomplished with the distinction between 506 B and C, but not all of it, right? Everybody's different. Everybody has different, um, levels of interest. They have different levels of experience. Um, it's important to figure that out and kind of know up front. Um, is this investor going to need and want more than we're going to be able to provide in terms of um, time commitment? That's really what it comes down to. Because what, what we do um, and what, a lot, what most syndicators do and should do is provide uh, updates, right? Whether that's monthly or quarterly, investors should know what's going on with the project. They should know how it's performing financially, how, is the how are the renovation funds being spent, um, how is our business plan being implemented? Has our business plan changed? You know, is there some, uh, some event that's caused us to reconsider our business plan? Um, maybe we expected to hold it for 10 years. And you know what? Three years in, the market is phenomenal. We can achieve our 10-year returns selling it at year three. Well, that's compelling. And that's something to consider. It's ultimately, we're a fiduciary. We have a fiduciary responsibility to the investors. If we can achieve 10-year returns at year three, we have to consider that. Um, I think you're asking also about kind of how communication goes with investors. Um, and that differs. Some sponsors and operators um, have more willingness to um, expose their time and be available to investors. And I think that's a function of probably their experience, their team, uh, their bandwidth and what systems they have put together. So if you're looking to go be a passive investor, um, make sure that you're, make sure that you understand what you can expect to receive as far as communication goes. Um, and we don't just want to hear when things are flowery and great and, and everything's sunshine. We, as a, if I'm a passive investor, I want to know when things are going poorly. I want to know when we lost a lot of uh, occupancy because, you know, something changed or, um, if we're not able to get uh, units renovated quickly enough, and we're gonna have a sustained vacancy. Uh, if construction prices have gone up, uh, which they have in the last couple years, as we all know. So um, it's, a, it's a really important process. There are a number of uh, software solutions, uh, internet web-based solutions that we as syndicators can utilize to help with that communication flow. Um, I love to see pictures. I love to see the details. I want to see all the numbers. And I think that's the responsibility of an investor to want that level of detail and, and then have it provided. So I think that's part of the vetting of the operator too. 
So if I'm hearing you right, it's better to over communicate on how things are going on the project and not sugarcoat it because Absolutely. people generally, if they're forking over quite a bit of money, they want to know what's going on, good, bad, or ugly, right? Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. Do you have any advice for people that are going to raise money? Like, let's say you have a multifamily project uh, under contract. You're looking to put together some capital from friends and family, or maybe it's, you know, maybe it's people you don't know. D how dumb do you keep your presentation? Because this gets really complicated. I mean, people generally, even if they're accredited investors, they're not going to understand all the stuff involved with this. They don't know what a they don't know what a 506B is, a 506C, like they probably don't care. They mm -hmm. just think this sounds like a good deal. I'm looking at my pro forma. It says I'm gonna get my money back at year three or four or whatever, and that's good enough for me. It looks like a, a good area that I'm investing in. Like how, how do you approach that when you're going out and pitching a project that you have with the intent of raising money from people that might be a little skittish? Yeah, good question. <clears throat> Um, one of the things we'll, one of the ways I'll answer that is at the bottom of the, the show notes, let, we'll put the link to the offering memorandum for that Lincoln portfolio. Okay, so multi-page uh, slide deck that goes into a lot of detail about the financial performance, the projections, the project, the market data. Um, and so that's really common to have an offering memorandum represent the type of investment that is being offered. Um, so photos of the project, photos of the community, uh, current performance, explanation about why it's a good deal, why we should be looking at it as an investment, and then projecting out 10 years of financial performance is very common. Um, so we'll put that at the bottom of the show notes. Um, also, when you're there, uh, there'll be an opportunity to go and log in to and create a profile as an investor to look at the other projects that we're working on. So if you're interested, uh, it's not a commitment to invest, but it's a commitment to stay in communication and continue to learn about what, what we're working on. So I would encourage you to do that. Uh, we won't, uh, won't uh, oversend or overcommunicate, but if you're here tonight and if this topic is of interest to you, I think you would uh, benefit from doing that. So one thing I didn't mention that, uh, that I want to make sure I bring up, I talked about long-term ownership being beneficial as a result of uh, tax benefits. So um, one of the things that we do, one of the tools that we utilize is a cost segregation study um, to, so a cost segregation study is a in-depth analysis, uh, oftentimes done by engineers, accountants, um, that uh, people that are very familiar with this type of asset, a multifamily building, and really high level, it's looking at uh, anything that's an improvement, anything that's not dirt. So anything that's been built on the property um, is depreciable. So over time, the value of it goes down. Um, our tax uh, structure allows us as owners to take advantage of that loss or decrease in value. That's translated to us as uh, essentially as write-offs. Um, so the investors, so when someone invests in our, uh, our project, it was a $4 million raise, use round numbers, someone brings a million of that, they get 25% of the write-offs and the depreciation. Um, I won't go too much deeper into the weeds, but if, um, if find me afterwards or find anyone on my team and we can talk more about that, um, but it's tremendously beneficial, especially to those of you in the room that can qualify as real estate professionals. Um, anyone, uh, so who in the room is a real estate professional? Awesome. So we got the question ab earlier about how do you qualify for that? Again, it's a conversation with your accountant. It's not a real estate license. Um, it's about how much of uh, how much investment in real estate do you have? How much time out of your year do you spend working on real estate? And um, if you're not familiar with depreciation or how it benefits us, when you're a real estate professional, we have the ability to take advantage of that property depreciation on an annual basis. Real, real high level definition or explanation of this. But when you're not a real estate professional, you can take advantage of the depreciation, but it builds up, it stores up for you, and you can take advantage of it when you sell the property. Okay, but those of us with real estate income, we need we need tax shelter. We need tax expo uh, we need tax protection, and depreciation is an excellent way to achieve that. Okay, let's uh, let me pause talking for a minute. Uh, we have two hot mics in the audience. Um, I also want to give away a book. Um, anyone want to jump up and ask a few questions? Come right up. Um, 
what's your process for filtering out your investors to match your investment? Like, how do you go about that? To, or do you just send it out, start having phone calls with everybody to see if this is a good investment for them? Or do you have a specific process on how you do that? There is definitely a process. That's a great question. Um, it's, um, and often, oftentimes the answer to that is it is conversation-based. Um, we, all of us that are, that are sponsors have uh, dozens and dozens of conversations over the phone. Um, you know, Zoom, anything, in-person, coffees. The bigger that we get, the larger the project, the more capital that we're raising, that responsibility gets spread and shared. So um, on, on our project in Lincoln, I'm gonna pick a number, my partners will correct me later, but let's say we had uh, you know, five professional capital raisers. So they're having conversations with all of their network about whether or not this is a good project. But at, at the end of the day, some of the basic questions are, you know, how long is somebody comfortable uh, committing their capital for? Are they wanting to get it returned back to them in two to three years? That's a short-term hold. If they're uh, happy to place it for 10 years, so that's a longer-term hold. And oftentimes, they're going to be more interested in the tax benefits as well. So um, some of those conversations will turn into um, discussions about uh, you know, wealth, you know, wealth planning and strategies they have for retirement. Do they have a 401k? Um, you can use your 401k up to a certain point to invest in real estate syndications. And it's a fantastic way to leverage uh, a, a pot of money that a lot of people don't think about being able to, to be put into real estate. So, um, yeah, I hope that helps. But it's, it's oftentimes very, um, you know, also a webinar is a Zoom. So we'll host webinars for projects. We'll record them. We'll put them out uh, on our site. We'll share them on LinkedIn, um, just as another way to kind of do this about a certain project and record it, go through a Q&A, and see if it's a good fit for somebody. It's on. Oh, hey. Hey, my name is Travis Banks. Uh, again, thank you for coming out and talking to us today. I have a couple of questions, if that's OK with you. You bet. Go for uh, it. So firstly, when it comes to underwriting a multifamily deal, obviously, it's a lot different than underwriting a single family deal when it comes to calculating cap CapEx and your net operating expense versus your NOI. So when you're calculating your CapEx um, and you're looking out in a 10 year span, right? How do you calculate the increase of your operating expense once your CapEx has been completed? Obviously if you update like a, um, a fitness center, or you add a fitness center into a multifamily that comes with added operating expense. So how do you factor that into an, in, an increased gross, you know, um, a, an increased gross income on yeah. a multifamily? Okay, great question. Um, when you were halfway through the question and you talked about a higher expense, uh, either ratio or expense burden, my, my initial thought was it should be the opposite. As we get in and stabilize a property, our ex the goal is to increase income and lower expenses, right? But you're talking about adding um, assets or amenities like a, like a fitness facility, um, or go, it goes on and on. Well, I would say first you know, gut reaction is whatever that expense that you're adding, whatever that amenity that we're adding, it should pay for itself. You know, ultimately, we're in the business of uh, improving NOI, net operating income. So if we're adding amenities that don't contribute to an improved NOI, we should reconsider whether we should add the amenity. So um, it can translate, to answer your question, it'll translate if it's, a, if it's the right type of amenity to add to a project, it should translate into higher gross income for the project. Gotcha. Yeah. And this next question is like a two-parter. Um, so you talked about earlier when it came to securing debt, bridge loans. Um, so I was doing some research on my own before I came here, and I realized that there's a lot of people on multifamily um, properties currently that have bridge loans out who may not be able to qualify with the new market conditions that we're in. Mm -hmm. So how much opportunity do you see in multifamily in the coming year or two with bridge loans coming due? Excellent question. And that's really the point of what I want to get into in this, in this segment is I agree with you, I, or if that's a question of whether I agree, I agree uh, mm -hmm. that there is a tremendous amount of opportunity coming up in this softening of the market that we're gonna see for that exact reason. And not just because of 
of projects that are in bridge loans. In conventional money, or in conventional loans that were um, locked for five years, so we're at the end of 22. So whoever bought in um, 18, 19, 17, 18, 19, um, or if they did a five-year lock on their rate, they're coming up to uh, refinance or a balloon payment scenario. Now they're entering a new debt market at a much different interest rate. You know, um, we were, so 18, 19, so call it 19, 20, 18, 19, 20, you know, we were seeing rates in the fours and the low fives. Um, rates that were in the threes, I think they tend, they, in my experience, they tended to have a longer lock. But um, yeah, if you're, if you're going from debt that's at four and a half, five percent now to six and a half, seven percent, that's a tremendously different debt service burden on the property. So that then translates to, well, what do we do? Do we have an ability still to recapitalize the project and, and keep it healthy? Or do we have to sell? Um, I don't think this is a great time to voluntarily want to sell right now. You know, and I'm going to kind of reinforce my point in a minute about that. So good questions. Hey there. I really just wanted to ask you about, um, you know, some of the different roles of, you know, a syndication or uh, people that are involved in a syndication is uh, specifically like the asset management and what functions of an asset manager uh, you do in a syndication and what some of those fees look like. Okay. The, the last part was fees. Is that what I heard? Yeah. Fees yeah. and okay, uh, cool. asset management. Yeah. Um, I think I actually had a couple... Yeah, so the very last uh, bullet sponsor compensation, um, asset management is a part of that, but you brought up fees too, and we didn't spend a lot of time there. Um, but I, I, I list that, asset management fee. It, it typically, it's commonly around 1% to 2% of gross income. Um, so it, it's typically paid out uh, quarterly to the asset management, to the, op to the general partners, or really it's not the general partners, it's the operating sponsors. And so what do they do, what do we do to earn that fee? Um, we, uh, as I said before, we make sure that the business plan is implemented. What does that mean? Um, today, my two partners in the back and I were in Lincoln, uh, walking units that are in the middle of renovation or completed renovation. Uh, we're making sure that the contractors and the property management company that may have checked the punch list off, uh, on a, on a, on a unit turn actually did what they are saying that they did. Um, we're making sure that the bulk materials that we're ordering, you know, by the pallet are where they say they are and they're the right product and that they're being utilized correctly by the, by the contractors or the property management company. We are communicating with the bank and providing quarterly financial statements to make sure that, that the bank knows the property is performing well. Um, we are developing the strategy, the branding and the marketing strategy to try to make sure that our portfolio of properties stands out in the market. Um, we're encouraging the property manager to consider new strategies. We are um, just doing a, it's just a sense, we're doing a variety of things to um, make our project excel. Um, talked about some other fees there, so I'll just mention those real quick. Um, guarantor fee. So if I'm signing on the debt, uh, if it's recourse debt, uh, which means that recourse versus non-recourse, um, just a real high level explanation. Uh, recourse debt means that there are individuals who I'll call sponsors, um, guarantors that are signing jointly and severally on the debt for the property, okay? That contrasts to non-recourse debt. Some lenders and some debt structures will, uh, are called non-recourse. And what it, what it refers to is that the lender, the lender's recourse should the property performance fail or the property gets foreclosed, that the bank's recourse, the debt provider's recourse is the property itself and not the, not the sponsors. That's important when you're signing on $20 million in debt, right? Um, asset management fee we talked about. Okay, acquisition fee. Um, acquisition fee is different oftentimes than a, a commission. Um, and it, and it goes to the sponsors for going through the entire process, sometimes months long, of um, setting up the structure and getting it to close. Uh, GC fee, general contracting fee, or construction management fee. 
Um, that's a fee that's a, a reflection of uh, what the renovation budget is, what's the level of renovation that's going to go into the project, and uh, who's going to make sure that it's done correctly. Um, disposition fee is a, essentially a, a, a fee that's achieved by the sponsors at the time that the property is sold. So good questions. Thanks, Dan. Yeah. Hi. My name is Jabin. Um, I have kind of a two-part question. Sure. I'm just curious on like, what's like your day-to-day, -day, like now that you've reached over 2,000 plus doors, like how much of this work is hands-on for you? Um, and then I'm wondering, um, how do you qualify a acquisition or a project? Like what do you base your metrics on? And like what's the minimum, especially in Nebraska, like if it's like a cap rate or a ROI, like what's the minimum? Hmm. Good questions. Um, day to day, it, it really varies. I, I build, I, I time block. So uh, there's parts of my day and my week where I devote to um, scheduled meetings. You know, I got a bunch of those during the week. I also have to make sure I have some flexible time in there to respond to whatever comes up, you know, um, the weekends too. So. Uh, we can talk, you know, more detail later, but it, it's important to, it's incredibly important to, so I, I do renovations, I didn't get into this, but I have uh, properties I own in Omaha where I'm the general contractor and I'm going to bring the contractors through and sub everything out and turn it. Um, I, do, I do development, have some partners, we're building 132 units on 38th Ave and Dodge across from the Taco Bell. So that's the largest development project I'm a part of. Uh, we're going to break ground in probably 18 to 24 months. It'll be a seven story apartment building in Blackstone. Um, so I work on that. Um, I go to Lincoln a lot. Uh, spend you know two days a week scheduled, late morning into afternoon in Lincoln at the properties with the property management company. Um, spend a lot of time on the phone with the gentleman in the back. Uh, I spend an early part of my week working with my brokers. Um, so it's a variety, and I love that. Uh, I don't get bored. Um, as far as the the types of projects. I probably don't have a great short answer for that. Um, generally speaking, I'm looking to buy uh, assets or properties that were built in the 90s or more recently than that. Um, I'm looking for projects that can be syndicated. What does that mean? It means they're going to provide an attractive enough return to an investor pool um, and that they're properties that, that, that myself and my partners want to operate uh, and be proud of. So it's kind of a short answer there, but that's that's generally where that comes from. Stephen, can I uh, interject here? Yeah. So Let's say you have a smoking deal that crosses your desk. Mm -hmm. What does that look like? How do you know when you have it? And how do you know when it's appropriate to form a syndication around it? Whether it's 506B, 506C, uh, your uncle, JV, whatever. How do, you, how, like, how do you know when you have a really good one? What does it look like? How would people in the audience even know if they have something that's worth syndicating? Yeah. That's a good question. Um, I would say that every every part, every step that we just kind of went through, from the ability to get attractive debt to the ability to pay out investors, is part of that answer. Um, I'm not going to say I'm not going to stand and say that it's got to have a 14% cash on cash return or a 20% uh, internal rate of return to uh, get our interest because we underwrite, uh, you know, I, I see projects that come across my desk that um, were built in the early 1900s, the early 2000s, uh, 10 units, um, 300 units, and I'm interested in all of them. Um, please bring me anything that, that you don't want to buy and um, I'd be happy to underwrite it. And, um, and if you would like a uh, fee or piece of the equity for finding it, I've done that dozens of times. That's, that's how I got interest in some of my projects was finding the deal but not really being able to answer that question of does it qualify as a good uh, syndication project. Um, great way to earn equity in, in large deals that have great returns. Um, but you know, generally speaking, it's got it, a project, well, again, I went back to Lincoln, it was the, it was the one we bought, bought most recently, but um, I love to look at projects and what really gets me excited is finding a property that I know is undervalued because it's not performing where it can perform. 
which means that the income is, let's say, 30% below what I know it can be. If, it's, if the income that it's producing is 30% or more below what it should be as a you know, nice, well-operated, attractive property, then there is a great opportunity there. Would anybody uh, in the audience like to hear uh, about an example of a deal where someone found a deal and brought it to maybe like a group like yours and they were able, to, like you mentioned, they carved out equity. What does that mean? And like, how does that look in real terms? Yeah. So somebody finds a, like they happen to know somebody who's selling an off market property and they don't really know for sure whether it's a great deal or not, but it certainly looks like it. What happens next after they uh, like look at it and they're like, I don't really know what to do with this. I don't, I can't take this whole thing down. Yeah. They bring it to a group like yours. How do they know that they're not gonna get a, taken advantage of, and B, like how do they even know what they have? Sure. Uh, what, what does that look like? Yeah, that's important. I've been on both sides of that too. Um, you know, five, six, seven years ago, I would find stuff and not really know how to structure it. Um, would take it to more experienced operators and sometimes did get taken advantage of, which translates really to not um, getting in return the full value of maybe what I could have had, could have, uh, you know, been awarded for finding the deal. So. Let's break it down and say um, you find a property um, you, and one of the important things is to be able to control the property. So ideally you know the seller. Um, if you're getting information about a property from a listing broker, it's different. Okay, the listing broker has motivations, a fiduciary responsibility to the seller. Um, I'm just gonna say it this way, to not give you a sweet deal, right? So if a listing broker is helping a seller sell and giving somebody a sweet deal, it means there was more meat on the table, there was more return or, or more uh, profit that that seller could have achieved. So let's talk about off-market properties. So we're gonna filter for properties that aren't advertised, they're not listed with a listing broker. If you find one, you know somebody, um, you bring it to an operator like myself and say, uh, let's say you have no idea what the property should be performing at or could be performing at, but you say, hey, I like this property, I thought you could help me underwrite it, um, what do you think? Okay, so I'm gonna do my underwriting. It's important for you, whether, no matter who you go to, to have some control over that relationship. Ideally, you know the seller, again, or you know that the opportunity is not able to be scooped. Don't get scooped, right? Don't, get, don't bring a project out into the public realm, into a very competitive environment. Um, I like to say that we work in a collaboratively competitive environment, right? But there's no mistake. Everybody in here wants a great deal. Um, everybody nationally that does what we do, they want great deals. So be careful and make sure that you've got some confidence in the relationship that you can keep that uh, opportunity. Sometimes that means getting it under contract. So if you're comfortable enough, you, tell you what, if you're uncomfortable getting it under contract and you know it's a good deal, that's a good sign that you should get it under contract. And structure it in such a way that you're, if you have to put earnest money down, that it's secure. So, it's, so if you're starting off and you don't know the value of a deal, but you know it's a deal, structure it in such a way so you've got a window where you can talk to people like me and find out if it really is a good deal and if it's something that you can, you can win from. And then if it's not, then you've got your earnest money back within 10 days or 30 days or whatever that looks like. Does that make sense? So, um, so stretch and push, you know, uh, go out beyond your comfort zone. If you think it's a good deal and you have experience to back that up, it probably is. Um, what does the fee look like or what does the return look like Again, it's negotiable in our business. Everything is negotiable in commercial real estate. So the better the deal, the better the fee. So approach an operator and say, hey, I've got this great deal. This is the underwriting I've done. You know, here's what you can underwrite from. Um, and the operator comes back and says, yeah, you're right, it's a good deal. Uh, how do you wanna do this? So whoever finds the property, you know, I always like to say, they've, the, they're in the driver's seat. So what do they want? Do they want a uh, fee? Do they just want cash? Cool, we'll do that. Do they want equity? Okay, well then how much? Depends on how good of a deal it is. A great deal means that they're gonna get more equity in that project. That's as simple as I can say it. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. I, like as a backstop to their own underwriting, even if like let's say they have some uncertainty about it. So you have kind of a newer person but they've been kind of through you know, some reps of underwriting deals. They have maybe somebody that they know personally, it's an off market deal they think it's good, they bring it to you, and you say, this is good. What 
do they any I guess and not to, not to create competition for yourself here with the equity portion of it but like is it a good move to involve an attorney or another ex experienced investor like how do they have confidence that they're making the right moves when it comes to dealing with somebody that does this for a living it's definitely it, it's great to get good advice right and then we just have to be careful that we're when we're going after that good advice that we're not exposing the deal like that's I'm trying to weave between the lines there because th the answer to your question is absolutely um, I don't know if it's an attorney I would say in in my in my um, my opinion it's other operators other investors um, online communities I mean how many online communities are there now where it's real estate investor focused where we can go out to a board and a thread or contact somebody directly and and say, hey, I've, I've seen that you've done this. I've got something similar. What do you think? Um, you know, that the community. So come to the RIA. You know, go to the folks that are here in this room um, that you know that have experience. Come to me. Come to the partners in the back. Um, Good and feedback. Yeah, yeah. So, Sean. As a 506B with just like friends and family, and then shifted it into a 506C later. Yes. And it was a function of, um, there's maybe some different motivations. The, the ones I can think of were if we needed to get here and we could get here with B structure, but we knew we could get here with C structure, there's a lot of, there's a compelling reason to go C. Um, does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, that's been the biggest motivation for me was going to a bigger investor pool to go with the C structure. It's not the only reason. Um, Yeah, but I guess that's probably a high level one. The other thing I was going to say was like matching the project and the time, the hold time and the return profile to the right investors. And maybe I didn't have that right investor base. Like maybe my 506B money is more longer term, lower risk tolerance. And maybe this is a short term flip uh, where there's a lot of risk, but there's also a lot of reward. Uh, in the last, you know, five, five, seven years, there's just been tremendous appreciation in our market. So being able to go in, strategically buy assets, that are undervalued or distressed, and then stabilize them, sell them in three years. I don't know how much wealth has been created in doing that, but it's a lot. So maybe that's a motivation too. So cool. Those are great questions. I want to give a book away. Um, so never split the difference. Um, Crystalline was kind enough to bring me some cards that were pulled out of the, uh, the, the basket. And so, Matt Anderson, your card was pulled. So come get the book. This is a great book if you haven't read it. Chris Voss, um, wh when I, when I want to get inspired about negotiating better, I read that. So congratulations, enjoy it. Um, cool, let me zip through, because I know, I, I, I think, I may be taking a little longer than I wanted to or that you guys might want me to. So let's go into kind of some market conditions um, and keep the questions coming. But what I intended for this section of the presentation is to get uh, directly to the point of what a lot of these questions have been around, which is what's going on in our current market cycle. Um, what the next three so slides are, and I'll just let you read them, what they represent um, are conversations that were had on weekly, monthly uh, conference calls uh, and the the source of the quotes in this case on this slide was CBRE. Um, CBRE, huge commercial brokerage, huge commercial lender, source of debt. Um, I'm sure we, we've all seen their signs all over the place. And I, I took this from a, a PowerPoint, or excuse me, a, a, a YouTube video uh, that James Ng provided. James Ng is a, a debt broker at Old Capital in Dallas. Um, this, the link to this uh, presentation is also going to be at the bottom of the, sh of the show notes, the podcast notes, so check this out. Um, it was from Q2, Q3. You get a sense here of um, a few things that I wanted to highlight. Uh, what's motivating a seller to sell right now, right? So interest rates have just gone up 200, 300, 350 basis points from where they were or where they have been over the last uh, you know, four or five years. Um, but prices have not come down significantly uh, for, for, those, for those assets. Why? Well, if I'm a seller, I don't want to lower my price, right? No, neither do you. So um, the, the, the pinch point, though, is not that there's not demand, as you can see in this 
and the next slide, um, these uh, Starwood Property Trust, uh, uh, ownership group with a tremendous portfolio, um, there's plenty of demand. The demand hasn't changed. That's one of the most interesting things right now. The demand, remember how hot the market has been for the last few years? That just hasn't gone to sleep. It's still there. But even if we can buy uh, a distressed property or a great opportunity and we can, we can buy it with bridge money or, or you know, private capital, whatever it's going to take to get the good deal, at some point we need to take that debt into a more conventional or stabilized structure. We, can't, we, can't, we shouldn't be keeping uh, debt on a property at bridge level interest for 10 years or five years. It's not healthy for the project. It's not sustainable. So right now we have this, uh, this discrepancy between what uh, I think, Jane, I think, uh, yeah, at the very bottom there, the asterisk. So the ask, uh, you know, versus the bid equals the spread. Right now, so the spread is the difference between the lowest ask and the highest bid. Makes sense. So we have this problem that we need to work through. And what's it going to take to work through it? Well, let's talk about that. Um, this is the second slide. This is the third. So Walker and Dunlap, uh, Dunlop, um, you know, another debt broker. Um, so again, um, we don't know what's going to happen to rates. We have, we, we know what we've been told, um, that um, we've had a tremendous increase in interest rates, that we can expect probably a little bit more, and then it's kind of wait and see. What do we know after that? We don't. We don't have a great projection after Q2, Q3 of next year. Um, I kind of put this slide together to summarize the last three um, and kind of show uh, you know, the first bullet there talks about banks and their, their, their level of uh, comfort with risk, right? Banks, traditionally speaking, are not very risk tolerant. They want to lower their risk and maximize their returns. That's what we all want. Um, DSC is a refer reference to debt service coverage. So with the historically high purchase prices and now the increased interest rates, what it's putting a, a pinch on is the debt service coverage ratio. So uh, real quick underwriting, um, the DSC is a, is a reflection of the income of a property after expenses as compared to its debt service. And banks typically like to see a 1.2, 1.25 debt service coverage ratio. So you've got about 25% more um, income than the debt service requirement for the property. That equals a uh, healthy or stabilized, stabilizable property. I don't think that's a word. Um, so the, the, the bottom comment there, this is kind of more related to those of you that are single family investors. Um, Rocket Mortgage, um, who, who we've heard and are familiar with, um, selling a lot of their mortgages and then um, pitching cash out refinancing. I thought the last sentence was pretty interesting. In 2021, only 54% of refis were used to pull cash out of homes compared to this 96% in August of 22. So it could mean a lot of things. Um, I don't have a crystal ball, but I thought that that was interesting. Um, these next four slides uh, were provided by an economist at uh, CCIM. Uh, CCIM is a professional uh, commercial real estate uh, networking group. Um, it's, um, I wanted to point out that uh, my broker, uh, one of the brokers at Cascade Commercial in the back, Jim Sanderson, is the incoming president of the Nebraska CCIM chapter. Um, it's, a, it's a fantastic role. I'm proud of you, Jim, for achieving this. Um, what Jim did was set up a uh, kind of a economic update, uh, brought in some folks from my network, from our network, had, had some lunch, and saw a presentation from Casey Conway, who's the source of this slide, and the next few slides. His presentation is also going to be noted at the bottom of these notes. So I'm not going to go into this. I wanted to give you a, like a little sample of what you can go and grab for yourself. But there's a tremendous amount of interesting um, economic information. Um, this one is, is focused on GDP by state. And so the darker blue states are, are the healthier states by GDP. Um, I thought this was interesting. Um, I have a background in water resource management. Uh, the Colorado River is heavily subscribed, means that um, the water that flows through the river is, uh, is allocated by right, water right. 
and uh, think about the states that the Colorado River runs through, Arizona, California, Colorado, New Mexico, et cetera, down to the Mexico border. And so it, this slide is kind of talking about the oversubscription of that uh, available water for agriculture and for cities. And it's a result of the drought, so we're in a drought. That's, uh, that's important when it comes to development. Development can be limited if uh, a new subdivision doesn't have enough water that can be allocated from the water district. So it's, it's important. It's going to have an impact on uh, construction of new homes. Um, I, I'm not going to go into this. The, the text is way too small, but again, an example. Um, his comment, Casey Conway's comment in that lower left corner and right here, his bottom line, his opinion is that um, values have the potential to go down. Property values, sale prices have the potential to go down by 24% as, as a result of the interest rate environment that we're in. Um, and then uh, one of the slides was on Nebraska. So his presentation was about Region 5. Region 5 is the Midwest. Uh, kind of there at the bottom, uh, our state um, is fiscally healthy in comparison to a lot of the other states in the Midwest. So again, I know that's really dense. Um, I know I've been up here talking for a while, so I wanted to just show you what is on uh, the show notes or as a link that's available to you. I think you'll find it interesting. Um, another book giveaway. Um, and this one is going to, let's see, let me make sure I got this right. Cool. Um, Travis Banks. So in light of what we're talking about, Ray Dalio's uh, Changing World Order. Uh, you bet. The book is yours. Enjoy it. Thank you. Ray Dalio uh, founded uh, Bridgewater, um, which is a, a tremendously large uh, investment fund, private capital, private equity group. Speaking of uh, equity and, and lendable equity, I want to kind of wrap up before we get into more questions. Uh, I should pause. Any questions that came out of that last section? Anybody wants to take the mic? Go right ahead. Uh, this last section is the shortest. Really just this slide. I wanted to highlight Quick Draw Lending. Quick Draw was started about a year and a half ago, uh, myself and two partners. And our goal was to uh, utilize capital to help investors achieve their goals through the purchase and reposition and disposition of small multifamily and single family properties. Uh, we lend in Nebraska, Iowa. Um, we will go to other states depending on scenario and situations, but what we typically do is we lend to investors like yourselves. Uh, some of our clients are in this room tonight, and uh, I'm one of them. I've borrowed money uh, from our group as well. The idea is lower left corner, um, up to 100% of purchase price and renovation can be borrowed for the right deal. What's the right deal? It, it means that you're getting a good deal on the, on the property, and we can talk about what that looks like. We'll lend money for six months. Um, our rates tend to float between 18 and 21, 22%. That's a big number. You're not meant to hold this debt for very long. What it helps you do is go out and get a great deal. So if you find a seller who's motivated and they need to close in five days, we can help you do that. It's very difficult to go to a conventional bank and say, I want to close in five days, right? So we can underwrite the property in-house, do a desktop underwrite. We're very familiar with the markets that we lend in, so we can act very quickly on your behalf. Um, we don't charge points. Um, our website is qdlending.com. Again, I'm here tonight. Paul, my partner, is here tonight. Catch us afterward, and I'm happy to discuss. Okay, upper right corner, what if you want to sit on the other side of the table? Do you have capital right now that you want to keep at work and keep earning and growing, but you're not finding deals to put it into, hard real estate deals to put it into? You can invest with us at Quick Draw, and we'll lend your money out to our borrowers. We'll pay 10% annual return, and we will provide that return to you, that interest of 10% on a monthly basis via ACH. Um, you can get your funds returned to you in 180 days, so you commit it to us for six months, okay? You can keep it rolling for six years, but if you want it back, just give us six months notice, and we'll structure it and get it back to you, get the principal back. But in the meantime, you learn 10% on it. Um, predictable monthly income, so that's, that's a benefit while we're sitting and kind of waiting. 
through a market cycle that, uh, where we might not be finding as many deals. So there's my plug for Quick Draw. Um, I'm kind of wrapping up. Um, I appreciate your attention so much, um, and I appreciate the questions. Are there any more questions from the group? Um, I know I'll be around. I think my partners will be around. We can grab a beer afterwards. Um, but I just, again, want to say that uh, the importance of this group and the important this importance of this opportunity is really about uh, long-term relationships. Um, you know, I've been doing this for eight years, and the support of my partners and the support of the community here in Omaha uh, has been a tremendous uh, help for me to grow. So I want to share the resources that have been shared with me. So feel free to reach out to me, connect with me anytime. I think we've got one more question. Yeah, my last question. Um, yeah. So I currently work in the stock market and I'm a Series 7 professional. So my question to you is when you're raising capital for like a 506C, um, what restrictions can come when you're trying to pool money together to purchase into a security? I know that comes with its own restrictions and licensing that needs to happen in that stead. The, the middle part of that question again was, I've got 506C. 506C and you're pooling money together to purchase a security. I know that comes with its own regulations. So how do you structure that if you have like a capital raiser? Obviously they're a general partner, but if you're going to have outsourcing that, how do you decide if you're gonna outsource or bring on a general partner? Excellent question. Um, getting into what are the requirements at the SEC level or otherwise for individuals to go out and sell securities, right? There are, um, there are structures, there are requirements that, that limit that type of uh, uh, activity. Um, I'm gonna keep this one brief. Um, I'm, I'm a little bit over my skis. I know based on my experience um, that capital raisers that, that do this professionally uh, need a series designation. I'm not going to speak to which one right now, but um, there are circumstances where they don't as well. And so it's important to work with a capital raiser that knows his or her business. Um, it's important for us to get legal advice, again, from our syndication attorney about who we can work with and who we can't, and then what are the requirements under that, uh, that relationship. So, uh, and you hit on one of them, that a capital raiser that has uh, ownership in the general partnership there are certain um, restrictions that are softened or removed as a result of that individual raising capital, having equity in the deal. So what do we do then? We just need to make sure that the capital raisers that are bringing significant uh, investment to our deals have a seat on the GP as well. Doesn't mean they're operating the property. We have a number of operating uh, GP partners, or I should say GP partners that don't operate on a day-to-day -day basis. So the general partnership is comprised of the sponsors, the active operators, and other GP members that have GP equity that they earned, uh, but don't operate the deal, if that makes sense. So that was a good question. Um, I have a couple more giveaways. Um, let's see, is um, Amber Bess in the room tonight? I know she is, I can see you. Um, I, hey Amber, I wanted to acknowledge you because uh, my wife Sarah and you used to work together, is what I understand. And I understand, yeah, I understand that I know. Well, she said to say hello. I want to give you a Cascade Commercial you. tumbler mug. Yeah. And so I, what I understand is that you um, recently left your W-2 position to pursue real estate investing full time. OK. Well, no, I'll take it back. No. Um, in, in any event, it's, it's that drive that uh, someday you'll probably leave it, right? So the real estate business um, has that potential to bridge our passions, and I heard about yours, so I wanted to acknowledge that. Um, and your website for the group, it Best Buys Homes, right? That's okay, you can be both. I'm a real estate broker and an operator. Um, so congratulations on, on your path. And then I have, um, let's see, Clint, Clint Blackburn, still here? All right. So this is a, a book by Gary Keller called The One Thing. Have you read it? Yes, sir, but I have not. You're welcome. I think you'll enjoy it. It certainly helped me. Um, at, the, at the end of the day, it's about what we focus on, right? That's the path we progress on is where we focus. Um, so I hope you enjoy that. And then last but not least, I have another Tumblr I want to give away. Noah Boganowski. Did I get that right? 
Snow is still there. Hey. So enjoy hot and cold beverages. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so thank you guys so much. I'm wrapped, and I really appreciate your attention, and I really appreciate the questions. Ted, I'll turn it back over to you.